Chapter six part two of Winds of Doctrine Studies in Contemporary Opinion by George Santayana. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter six The Genteel Tradition in American Philosophy Part two. There was another element in Emerson, curiously combined with transcendentalism, namely his love and respect for nature nature for the transcendentalist is precious because it is his own work a mirror in which he looks at himself and says like a poet relishing his own verses what a genius i am who would have thought there was such stuff in me and the philosophical egotist finds in his doctrine a ready explanation of whatever beauty and commodity nature actually has no wonder he says to himself that nature is sympathetic since i made it and such a view one-sided and even fatuous as it may be undoubtedly sharpens the vision of a poet and a moralist to all that is inspiriting and symbolic in the natural world emerson was particularly ingenious and clear-sighted in feeling the spiritual uses of fellowship with the elements this is something in which all teutonic poetry is rich and which forms i think the most genuine and spontaneous part of modern taste and especially of american taste just as some people are naturally enthralled and refreshed by music so others are by landscape music and landscape make up the spiritual resources of those who cannot or dare not express their unfulfilled ideals in words serious poetry profound religion calvinism for instance are the joys of an unhappiness that confesses itself but when a genteel tradition forbids people to confess that they are unhappy serious poetry and profound religion are closed to them by that and since human life in its depths cannot then express itself openly imagination is driven for comfort into abstract arts where human circumstances are lost sight of and human problems dissolve in a purer medium the pressure of care is thus relieved without its quietus being found in intelligence to understand oneself is the classic form of consolation to elude oneself is the romantic in the presence of music or landscape human experience eludes itself and thus romanticism is the bond between transcendental and naturalistic sentiment the winds and clouds come to minister to the solitary ego have there been we may ask any successful efforts to escape from the genteel tradition and to express something worth expressing behind its back this might well not have occurred as yet but america is so precocious it has been trained by the genteel tradition to be so wise for its years that some indications of a truly native philosophy and poetry are already to be found i might mention the humorists of whom you here in california have had your share the humorists however only half escaped the genteel tradition their humour would lose its savour if they had wholly escaped it they point to what contradicts it in the facts but not in order to abandon the genteel tradition for they have nothing solid to put in its place when they point out how ill many facts fit into it they do not clearly conceive that this militates against the standard but think it a funny perversity in the facts of course did they earnestly respect the genteel tradition such an incongruity would seem to them sad rather than ludicrous perhaps a prevalence of humour in america in and out of season may be taken as one more evidence that the genteel tradition is present pervasively but everywhere weak similarly in italy during the renaissance the catholic tradition could not be banished from the intellect since there was nothing articulate to take its place yet its hold on the heart was singularly relaxed the consequence was that humorists could regale themselves with the foibles of monks and of cardinals with the credulity of fools and the bogus miracles of the saints not intending to deny the theory of the church but caring for it so little at heart that they could find it infinitely amusing that it should be contradicted in men's lives and that no harm should come of it so when mark twain says i was born of poor but dishonest parents the humour depends on the parody of the genteel anglo-saxon convention that it is disreputable to be poor but to hint at the hollowness of it would not be amusing if it did not remain at bottom one's habitual conviction 
the one american writer who has left the genteel tradition entirely behind is perhaps walt whitman for this reason educated americans find him rather an unpalatable person who they sincerely protest ought not to be taken for a representative of their culture and he certainly should not because their culture is so genteel and traditional but the foreigner may sometimes think otherwise since he is looking for what may have arisen in america to express not the polite and conventional american mind but the spirit and the inarticulate principles that animate the community on which its own genteel mentality seems to sit rather lightly when the foreigner opens the pages of walt whitman he thinks that he has come at last upon something representative and original in walt whitman democracy is carried into psychology and morals the various sights moods and emotions are given each one vote they are declared to be all free and equal and the innumerable commonplace moments of life are suffered to speak like the others those moments formerly reputed great are not excluded but they are made to march in the ranks with their companions plain foot soldiers and servants of the hour nor does the refusal to discriminate stop there we must carry our principle further down to the animals to inanimate nature to the cosmos as a whole whitman became a pantheist but his pantheism unlike that of the stoics and of spinoza was unintellectual lazy and self-indulgent for he simply felt jovially that everything real was good enough and that he was good enough himself in him bohemia rebelled against the genteel tradition but the reconstruction that alone can justify revolution did not ensue his attitude in principle was utterly disintegrating his poetic genius fell back to the lowest level perhaps to which it is possible for poetic genius to fall he reduced his imagination to a passive sensorium for the registering of impressions no element of construction remained in it and therefore no element of penetration but his scope was wide and his lazy desultory apprehension was poetical his work for the very reason that it is so rudimentary contains a beginning or rather many beginnings that might possibly grow into noble moral imagination a worthy filling for the human mind an american in the nineteenth century who completely disregarded the genteel tradition could hardly have done more but there is another distinguished man lately lost to this country who has given some rude shocks to this tradition and who as much as whitman may be regarded as representing the genuine the long silent american mind i mean william james he and his brother henry were as tightly swaddled in the genteel tradition as any infant geniuses could be for they were born before eighteen fifty and in a swedenborgian household yet they burst those bands almost entirely the ways in which the two brothers freed themselves however are interestingly different mr henry james has done it by adopting the point of view of the outer world and by turning the genteel american tradition as he turns everything else into a subject matter for analysis for him it is a curious habit of mind intimately comprehended to be compared with other habits of mind also well known to him thus he has overcome the genteel tradition in the classic way by understanding it with william james too this infusion of worldly insight and european sympathies was a potent influence especially in his earlier days but the chief source of his liberty was another it was his personal spontaneity similar to that of emerson and his personal vitality similar to that of nobody else convictions and ideas came to him so to speak from the subsoil he had a prophetic sympathy with the dawning sentiments of the age with the moods of the dumb majority his scattered words caught fire in many parts of the world his way of thinking and feeling represented the true america and represented in a measure the whole ultra-modern radical world thus he eluded the genteel tradition in the romantic way by continuing it into its opposite the romantic mind glorified in hegel's dialectic which is not dialectic at all but a sort of tragicomic history of experience is always rendering its thoughts unrecognizable through the infusion of new insights and through the insensible transformation of the moral feeling that accompanies them till at last it has completely reversed its old judgments under cover of expanding them 
thus the genteel tradition was led a merry dance when it fell again into the hands of a genuine and vigorous romanticist like william james he restored their revolutionary force to its neutralized elements by picking them out afresh and emphasizing them separately according to his personal predilections for one thing william james kept his mind and heart wide open to all that might seem to polite minds odd personal or visionary in religion and philosophy he gave a sincerely respectful hearing to sentimentalists mystics spiritualists wizards cranks quacks and impostors for it is hard to draw the line and james was not willing to draw it prematurely he thought with his usual modesty that any of these might have something to teach him the lame the halt the blind and those speaking with tongues could come to him with the certainty of finding sympathy and if they were not healed at least they were comforted that a famous professor should take them so seriously and they began to feel that after all to have only one leg or one hand or one eye or to have three might be in itself no less beauteous than to have just two like the stolid majority thus william james became the friend and helper of those groping nervous half-educated spiritually disinherited passionately hungry individuals of which america is full he became at the same time their spokesman and representative before the learned world and he made it a chief part of his vocation to recast what the learned world has to offer so that as far as possible it might serve the needs and interests of these people yet the normal practical masculine american too had a friend in william james there is a feeling abroad now to which biology and darwinism lend some colour that theory is simply an instrument for practice and intelligence merely a help toward material survival bears it is said have fur and claws but poor naked man is condemned to be intelligent or he will perish this feeling william james embodied in that theory of thought and of truth which he called pragmatism intelligence he thought is no miraculous idle faculty by which we mirror passively any or everything that happens to be true reduplicating the real world to no purpose intelligence has its roots and its issue in the context of events it is one kind of practical adjustment an experimental act a form of vital tension it does not essentially serve to picture other parts of reality but to connect them this view was not worked out by william james in its psychological and historical details unfortunately he developed it chiefly in controversy against its opposite which he called intellectualism and which he hated with all the hatred of which his kind heart was capable intellectualism as he conceived it was pure pedantry it impoverished and verbalized everything and tied up nature in red tape ideas and rules that may have been occasionally useful it put in the place of the full-blooded irrational movement of life which had called them into being and these abstractions so soon obsolete it strove to fix and to worship for ever thus all creeds and theories and all formal precepts sink in the estimation of the pragmatist to a local and temporary grammar of action a grammar that must be changed slowly by time and may be changed quickly by genius to know things as a whole or as they are eternally if there is anything eternal in them is not only beyond our powers but would prove worthless and perhaps even fatal to our lives ideas are not mirrors they are weapons their function is to prepare us to meet events as future experience may unroll them those ideas that disappoint us are false ideas those to which events are true are true themselves this may seem a very utilitarian view of the mind and i confess i think it a partial one since the logical force of beliefs and ideas their truth or falsehood as assertions has been overlooked altogether or confused with the vital force of the material processes which these ideas express it is an external view only which marks the place and conditions of the mind in nature but neglects its specific essence as if a jewel were defined as a round hole in a ring nevertheless the more materialistic the pragmatist theory of the mind is the more vitalistic his theory of nature will have to become if the intellect is a device produced in organic bodies to expedite their processes 
these organic bodies must have interests and a chosen direction in their life otherwise their life could not be expedited nor could anything be useful to it in other words and this is a third point at which the philosophy of william james has played havoc with the genteel tradition while ostensibly defending it nature must be conceived anthropomorphically and in psychological terms its purposes are not to be static harmonies self-unfolding destinies the logic of spirit the spirit of logic or any other formal method and abstract law its purposes are to be concrete endeavours finite efforts of souls living in an environment which they transform and by which they too are affected a spirit the divine spirit as much as the human as this new animism conceives it is a romantic adventurer its future is undetermined its scope its duration and the quality of its life are all contingent this spirit grows it buds and sends forth feelers sounding the depths around for such other centres of force or life as may exist there it has a vital momentum but no predetermined goal it uses its past as a stepping-stone or rather as a diving-board but has an absolutely fresh will at each moment to plunge this way or that into the unknown the universe is an experiment it is unfinished it has no ultimate or total nature because it has no end it embodies no formula or statable law any formula is at best a poor abstraction describing what in some region and for some time may be the most striking characteristic of existence the law is a description a posteriori of the habit things have chosen to acquire and which they may possibly throw off altogether what a day may bring forth is uncertain uncertain even to god omniscience is impossible time is real what had been omniscience hitherto might discover something more to-day there shall be news william james was fond of saying with rapture quoting from the unpublished poem of an obscure friend there shall be news in heaven there is almost certainly he thought a god now there may be several gods who might exist together or one after the other we might by our conspiring sympathies help to make a new one much in us is doubtless immortal we survive death for some time in a recognizable form but what our career and transformations may be in the sequel we cannot tell although we may help to determine them by our daily choices observation must be continual if our ideas are to remain true eternal vigilance is the price of knowledge perpetual hazard perpetual experiment keep quick the edge of life this is so far as i know a new philosophical vista it is a conception never before presented although implied perhaps in various quarters as in norse and even greek mythology it is a vision radically empirical and radically romantic and as william james himself used to say the visions and not the arguments of a philosopher are the interesting and influential things about him william james rather too generously attributed this vision to m bergson and regarded him in consequence as a philosopher of the first rank whose thought was to be one of the turning points in history m bergson had killed intellectualism it was his book on creative evolution said james with humorous emphasis that had come at last to écraser l'enfant we may suspect notwithstanding that intellectualism infamous and crushed will survive the blow and if the author of the book of ecclesiastes were now alive and heard that there shall be news in heaven he would doubtless say that there may possibly be news there but that under the sun there is nothing new not even radical empiricism or radical romanticism which from the beginning of the world has been the philosophy of those who as yet had had little experience for to the blinking little child it is not merely something in the world that is new daily but everything is new all day i am not concerned with the rights and wrongs of that controversy my point is only that william james in this genial evolutionary view of the world has given a rude shock to the genteel tradition what the world a gradual improvisation creation unpremeditated god a sort of young poet or struggling artist william james is an advocate of theism pragmatism adds one to the evidence of religion that is excellent but is not the cool abstract piety of the genteel getting more than it asks for 
this empirical naturalistic god is too crude and positive a force he will work miracles he will answer prayers he may inhabit distinct places and have distinct conditions under which alone he can operate he is a neighbouring being whom we can act upon and rely upon for specific aids as upon a personal friend or a physician or an insurance company how disconcerting is not this new theology a little like superstition and yet how interesting how exciting if it should happen to be true i am far from wishing to suggest that such a view seems to me more probable than conventional idealism or than christian orthodoxy all three are in the region of dramatic system-making and myth to which probabilities are irrelevant if one man says the moon is sister to the sun and another that she is his daughter the question is not which notion is more probable but whether either of them is at all expressive the so-called evidences are devised afterwards when faith and imagination have prejudged the issue the force of william james's new theology or romantic cosmology lies only in this that it has broken the spell of the genteel tradition and enticed faith in a new direction which on second thoughts may prove no less alluring than the old the important fact is not that the new fancy might possibly be true who shall know that but that it has entered the heart of a leading american to conceive and to cherish it the genteel tradition cannot be dislodged by these insurrections there are circles to which it is still congenial and where it will be preserved but it has been challenged and what is perhaps more insidious it has been discovered no one need be browbeaten any longer into accepting it no one need be afraid for instance that his fate is sealed because some young prig may call him a dualist the pint would call the court a dualist if you tried to pour the court into him we need not be afraid of being less profound for being direct and sincere the intellectual world may be traversed in many directions the whole has not been surveyed there is a great career in it open to talent that is a sort of knell that tolls the passing of the genteel tradition something else is now in the field something else can appeal to the imagination and be a thousand times more idealistic than academic idealism which is often simply a way of whitewashing and adoring things as they are the illegitimate monopoly which the genteel tradition had established over what ought to be assumed and what ought to be hoped for has been broken down by the first-born of the family by the genius of the race henceforth there can hardly be the same peace and the same pleasure in hugging the old proprieties hegel will be to the next generation what sir william hamilton was to the last nothing will have been disproved but everything will have been abandoned an honest man has spoken and the cant of the genteel tradition has become harder for young lips to repeat with this i have finished such a sketch as i am here able to offer you of the genteel tradition in american philosophy the subject is complex and calls for many an excursus and qualifying footnote yet i think the main outlines are clear enough the chief fountains of this tradition were calvinism and transcendentalism both were living fountains but to keep them alive they required one an agonized conscience and the other a radical subjective criticism of knowledge when these rare metaphysical preoccupations disappeared and the american atmosphere is not favourable to either of them the two systems ceased to be inwardly understood they subsisted as sacred mysteries only and the combination of the two in some transcendental system of the universe a contradiction in principle was doubly artificial besides it could hardly be held with a single mind natural science history the beliefs implied in labour and invention could not be disregarded altogether so that the transcendental philosopher was condemned to a double allegiance and to not letting his left hand know the bluff that his right hand was making nevertheless the difficulty in bringing practical inarticulate convictions to expression is very great and the genteel tradition has subsisted in the academic mind for want of anything equally academic to take its place the academic mind however has had its flanks turned on the one side came the revolt of the bohemian temperament with its poetry of crude naturalism on the other side came an impassioned empiricism welcoming popular religious witnesses to the unseen 
reducing science to an instrument of success and action and declaring the universe to be wild and young and not to be harnessed by the logic of any school this revolution i should think might well find an echo among you who live in a thriving society and in the presence of a virgin and prodigious world when you transform nature to your uses when you experiment with her forces and reduce them to industrial agents you cannot feel that nature was made by you or for you for then these adjustments would have been pre-established much less can you feel it when she destroys your labour of years in a momentary spasm you must feel rather that you are an offshoot of her life one brave little force among her immense forces when you escape as you love to do to your forests and your sierras i am sure again that you do not feel you made them or that they were made for you they have grown as you have grown only more massively and more slowly in their non-human beauty and peace they stir the subhuman depth and the superhuman possibilities of your own spirit it is no transcendental logic that they teach and they give no sign of any deliberate morality seated in the world it is rather the vanity and superficiality of all logic the needlessness of argument the relativity of morals the strength of time the fertility of matter the variety the unspeakable variety of possible life everything is measurable and conditioned indefinitely repeated yet in repetition twisted somewhat from its old form everywhere is beauty and nowhere permanence everywhere an incipient harmony nowhere an intention nor a responsibility nor a plan it is the irresistible suasion of this daily spectacle it is the daily discipline of contact with things so different from the verbal discipline of the schools that will i trust inspire the philosophy of your children a californian whom i had recently the pleasure of meeting observed that if the philosophers had lived among your mountains their systems would have been different from what they are certainly i should say very different from what those systems are which the european genteel tradition has handed down since socrates for these systems are egotistical directly or indirectly they are anthropocentric and inspired by the conceited notion that man or human reason or the human distinction between good and evil is the centre and pivot of the universe that is what the mountains and the woods should make you at last ashamed to assert from what indeed does the society of nature liberate you that you find it so sweet it is hardly is it that you wish to forget your past or your friends or that you have any secret contempt for your present ambitions you respect these you respect them perhaps too much you are not suffered by the genteel tradition to criticise or to reform them at all radically no it is the yoke of this genteel tradition itself that these primeval solitudes lift from your shoulders they suspend your forced sense of your own importance not merely as individuals but even as men they allow you in one happy moment at once to play and to worship to take yourself simply humbly for what you are and to salute the wild indifferent non-censorious infinity of nature you are admonished that what you can do avails little materially and in the end nothing at the same time through wonder and pleasure you are taught speculation you learn what you are really fitted to do and where lie your natural dignity and joy namely in representing many things without being them and in letting your imagination through sympathy celebrate and echo their life because the peculiarity of man is that his machinery for reaction on external things has involved an imaginative transcript of these things which is preserved and suspended in his fancy and the interest and beauty of this inward landscape rather than any fortunes that may await his body in the outer world constitute his proper happiness by their mind its scope quality and temper we estimate men for by the mind only do we exist as men and are more than so many storage batteries for material energy let us therefore be frankly human let us be content to live in the mind end of chapter six recording by expatriate in bangor maine end of winds of doctrine studies in contemporary opinion by george santayana